Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for joining us for one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic Chin Han to talk all about his movie Mortal Kombat. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was um, the thing that got you to say yes to the role, being Simon McCoy showing you your character's costume and all of the fabulous detail that came with that. And just wanted to ask about what it was about seeing a lot of the details that he had in mind in terms of the visual aspects of your character, what it was with all of that that made you say yes and know that you desperately wanted to take on this character in the film? Well, it's, uh, you know, when you're doing this kinds of movies, uh, especially action movies, you know, you're, you're dealing with characters that have a long history and they're so well established already. And sometimes, especially with video games, you know, they can play like uh, ciphers as well. You know, I mean, I think what I want to, the experience that I wanted to have or want to have on any movie is, you know, it's is to be able to plumb a character that is, you know, more textured and, and has different layers. And, uh, you know, I think with him showing me the artwork, you know, that you, you got a sense of it. You know, you got a sense that even if the action in the movie is moving like a freight train, that you at least still have visual cues and design cues that will reveal character to you. You know, and so that was kind of comforting for me because, you know, you're looking at the script and you're reading it as action, you know, and, and, and fatalities and flawless victories and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, okay, what, you know, is the character going to be lost in all that action? And, you know, I think as an actor, you just want to be assured that, you know, uh, no, you know, I mean, either we're going to do this by dialogue or we're going to do that by uh, visual cues and you know film is a visual medium so we will we'll, we'll do it one way or the other and I think that was how uh, Simon uh, kind of sold me on the idea of the film. And it sounds like one of the one of the challenges with this character in particular as well was inhabiting someone where their goal is literally to take people's souls and to crush them. And, you know, that detailing is down to, again, going back to the costume, it's he has the faces of people whose souls he's taken etched into what he wears every single day. And so how did you take that aspect of him and really think about the genesis of this for him and kind of build it into like traditional character development for yourself? Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's interesting that way, right? I mean, sometimes yeah. um, you work from outside in, sometimes you work from inside out, sometimes you work from uh, the creation of a, a backstory and biodata, and sometimes you work from uh, just a, a dominant impulse. And then we're talking about sociopaths and we're talking about psychopaths already. It's, it's very hard to even go into the the genesis of that because <laughs> there's so many factors involved. Um, for example, I mean, I, I love I love No Country for Old Men and I love, you know, what uh, Harvey Badem did with uh, Anton Chigurh. Now, Anton Chigurh is, you know, one could argue that he lacks complexity, but on the other hand, he's such a force of nature that he's undeniable and so compelling to watch anyway. So I think uh, when you look at a character like Shang Tsung, then, you know, I mean, you, you can take him that far with all the lore because, I mean, the lore in video games and the previous iterations of it, I mean, they, they all vary, you know, because there are different timelines and there are retcons and reboots and <laughs> with every, every game that's been around for about 30 years. You can take it that far in terms of the backstory and the history. And then after that, you know, I, I think, if you can understand the appetite of someone like that, you know, if you can just kind of surrender to a very singular impulse, and and you know, I, I think you might be able to then get at the heart of this particular uh, character. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a curious. Uh, this this character is is one of the more curious and interesting ones that I've had to kind of flesh out and create really. And one of the details that's really interesting is actually how he views death and he makes that reference about death is just a portal. So he almost doesn't see it as a final conclusion to anyone either, which is interesting for a character that's surrounded by so much death throughout his existence. Um, and so how do you take a lot of details like that and build it into the fabric of, of who they're gonna be for you? Well, I mean, that's, that's very important. That line actually, you know, not only 
speaks to all the death in the movie, but it also speaks to, you know, it speaks to new beginnings, right? It speaks to uh, how things can sublimate from one form to another. And so, you know, I mean, I, I, I wrote an entire speech for that final scene. I mean, obviously what makes it into the film is what was appropriate for the, you know, for the, for the, for the tone of it and for the pace of it. But, you know, the idea of it being, uh, death only being another portal, th there is more to that. I mean, and more to that was that it's a distortion of space and time, basically. And that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's all, perception and and you know and, and we can alter our realities which means interdimensional travel and all that kind of stuff you know so so that that line means something and i'm so glad that you picked it up really <laughs> because um it it feeds into his recklessness it feeds into his voracious appetites it feeds into his lack of empathy because if it is just a portal then I'm going to satiate myself till, you know, till I am satiated, you know, and it's like going to a buffet in Vegas, which is never ending. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to stay there, you know, for, for, you know, for as long as I can eat really, you know, I, I think about this, uh, I'm going to invoke uh, Jordan and Peele, right. Uh, they, they have a skit that's so funny that is, I don't know, it's called Party All Night or something. And then they, they keep singing this song, Party All Night, and it keeps going and it keeps going. And it, keeps, it never ends until it comes to a point where he wants to kill, him, to kill themselves, really, because, because it never ends. But that, that is also one of the interesting aspects of this character because, um, you know, he, he's vampiric in, in a way, you know, and, and there comes a point in immortality where even then you're looking for change and you know um and, and all of that helps to you know supplement the 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 actions which is the soul sucking and the, and the death and destruction that he orchestrates you know in the film and even going beyond that that specific line there's so many lines that you're delivering in this film that have such a history you know we're looking at mortal kombat and the 30 plus years that it's been in existence and and the emotional connection that people have when they hear certain words and certain lines and so when you were delivering some of those lines throughout the film how did taking on board that history and what people's expectations of it might be already from your performance really lead into how you chose the delivery for them well the it's interesting to see how other actors have chosen to deliver them. And then also, I mean, there's the delivery in the game itself too, right? I mean, there are voice actors who have done that. Um, I think there there is a performance for every age. You know, I think if you look at something like uh, Little Women, for example, that that is a very different kind of movie from the one, even, you know, from the 90s, you know, with Winona Ryder and then going back further to Catherine Hepburn. There, there are different performances for different times. It depends on the zeitgeist and the general feeling, you know, uh, of the time. And I, I think there is, there was such a, there was such an interesting line that he used in the trailer where I go kill them. <laughs> and, you know, I think Carrie back in 95, and I, th I think it's a question of personal taste as well. Some people love, love that, that very open, big, delivery that he he he, get, he, get, he gives in that film but that was you know a point of discussion with Simon as well just like okay well you know I mean we, we are in the time of of hyper realism right I mean you see drama in the news you have reality shows you know a plethora of reality reality shows on tv you know that there, there is all of that already you know so do we want now to have some verisimilitude to the, the world that we live in, or do we, you know, do we, do we then, you know, surrender to the, the high uh, drama, you know, and, and high camp of, of another time? And uh, I think we came to the agreement that uh, we wanted something that, you know, that could be fresh, you know, or could be uh, of interest to, 
the audience today. So, I mean, as you can see, I mean, that, 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 that line, finish them or kill them was, was you know, almost, uh, almost whispered. Yeah. And what's really interesting when you look at the film as a whole, though, is that there are moments where it does feel a little bit like the video game as well. And it definitely has that aesthetic and that tone within it, but in a way that feels very cinematic, which is such a such an accomplishment for the movie. And so what were a lot of the conversations that, that Simon had in terms of trying to figure that out and trying to figure out how that then impacted performances and, and character choices to bring that to the foreground? Um. I think some some of it obviously is in is baked into the script already. So I mean, if it's baked into the script and in terms of structure, and we're talking about uh, a story of revenge, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, or uh, an age old uh, legacy of violence that these people have to fulfill, right? I mean, that that is operatic in its own way. And so as an actor, I think you just plug yourself in. You know, I don't think you need to kind of, you know, I don't think you need to kind of add juice to it really, you know, because it is baked into the structure, but also uh, not only the costumes, right? I mean, obviously the thing that, you know, sometimes we miss is hair and makeup. And hair and makeup is, is very crucial as well, you know, in terms of uh, what we decided for, uh, for Shanson's hair and then makeup with Nikki Gouli. It's very interesting because, you know, I was talking to her, we were trying to determine the, the age of uh, Shanson and we came up with about a, a thousand years, I think. He's, he's probably more than a, in excess of a thousand years. Mm, even if he was Dorian Gray, right? And he was never, never old, but all that soul sucking and, and intake of people. I mean, what happens to him? You know, what happens to his skin that is a thousand years old? You know, <laughs> what happens to hair when it's a thousand years old? What kind of conditioner would he use or moisturizes? Um, <laughs> I'm kidding there, but <laughs> the thing is, you know, how, how porous the skin is, right? So we, we came up with all the, uh, you know, all the, the veins and and, and, you know, and, and a degree of a pallor to him. So I, I think, um, how do we plug ourselves into that? I, I think, uh, you know, I, I have to credit all these people for helping me plug it to all of that, you know? And then the rest of it is basically the, the words, basically. I mean, and, and, and being able to invoke a, a cadence or a rhythm that is not of this time. You know, I mean, the time, the, the kind of way that we speak these days is, you know, has a, has a different rhythm, has a different clip, you know, has a, has, has a different kind of cadence. And I think trying to get the sound of it right uh, was, the, was the tricky part. Yeah, there's a there's a different deliberate kind of like slight slowness to a lot of the pacing and that even comes down to some of the slightly more comedic moments as well, which you have with some of your team and, and so when you were trying to figure out the comedy and what that was going to look like with that cadence, what was the journey of discovering how to still land the humor but thinking about it with very different pacing to how we tell jokes now. Uh, I think, I think it is about uh, what, what you find it funny right I mean I think that if you read Shakespeare as well, you know, I mean, some of his jokes just go over your head because, you know, not, no, no one, for one thing, the words are a little different, but for another thing, the things people find funny in the past, people might not find funny at all now. So I think, like, um, I think when I'm with my team, uh, the, the Motley crew of Cabal, Reiko, and Melina, and even Natara, who's, uh, who is, ostensibly, you know, his favorite and his darling, you know, there is, a, there, there is an element of it that, you know, you, you, there's an absurdist quality of it that I think you just need to acknowledge, I think, that I speak to Simon a lot about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm talking, I'm saying, like, you know, this feels like, this feels like German expressionist cinema, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a, uh, not to the, you know, not to the, 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 the extreme, not to the point of Nicolas Cage, but, you know, I mean, like German expressionist cinema. So I'm like, so how does that work? You know, I mean, how does that work? Is that, is that, you know, 
Sunset Boulevard, you know, that glorious Swanson. <laughs> so, so, for example, you know, the line where Natara flies in and I look at her and I get such, you know, I'm, I'm won over by her and I go, she is beautiful. <laughs> that totally is Sunset Boulevard, right? <laughs> and so, so that, that is... That that is the fun part of it, but you know we we, we you know we we had to kind of kind of look look for it, you know. Yeah, and you also found such a specific tone within your voice and the way that you speak for this character as well. So, how did you determine what that was going to be for him? Um, it, it was hard because you know I think we, we are in a in a movie with a lot of villains, right? You know, and, and I think the the go to for villains are is is a deep base <laughs> it, it just is right i mean i think from the time of, of, of dark data to even tim curry in, in legend which is so wonderful uh or or even the kurgan in highlander i, I don't know if, are you a movie buff i mean these, these yeah. references. okay so all these references these are all my favorite villains of, of movies right um there there is a base very basic quality to the <laughs> places. And so to find that register was not easy because, you know, I mean, I think Sub-Zero, uh, Joe came also prepared with, you know, with some kind of, uh, with, with, a, with a quality of voice to it. And I think Hiroyuki comes with his own, you know, um, I think vocal uh, quality. So they all came with different, different voices. And, and, you know, you couldn't just, you know, you couldn't just pick, uh, you know, a, a voice with more bass. You know, we had to kind of find where we want to land with it. And I think the decision was born out of listening to, to Joe, uh, listening to Hiroyuki, you know, uh, and then trying to figure out something that will, you know, that will kind of fit into that mix of uh, voices or that soundscape for me. And Simon was also really specific about wanting to do as many effects as possible, um, even down to location details as in camera, rather than having VFX throughout the entire film. And we even see that at the point where you filmed that, that really great scene in a really desolate location in an abandoned coal mine area. Um, and so how did that really influence the way that you worked on a lot of the scenes, just making sure that everything that we see in camera is really as it was in the moment when you were filming it? Well, in camera is uh, is a luxury, I think. You know, I've done quite a lot of movies and, you know, quite a lot of them involve uh, blue screen or green screen. Uh, personally, I, I kind of enjoy blue, but they, they, they aren't used that much anymore. You know, they, they, used to use, they used to use blue for everything, right? So yeah. when I was doing, um, yeah, when I was, and like 2012 was blue. And, you know, I, I think the, the early days of, Visual effects was blue, and then they they you know they converted to green, and now it's all green. But what Simon did with uh, with uh, Mortal Kombat was he actually went back to blue screen, which I which I enjoy because I find the the, the color a lot more uh, you know a lot more soothing really. But uh, shooting in camera uh, shooting in camera means that you're actually on location, and as I said, that's a that is quite the luxury, you know, because as an actor, you you know, it helps you, it, it helps you immerse yourself in the in the environment. You know, it's hard to, you don't have to act the heat, you don't have to act the dust, you know, you don't have to act, you know, the feeling oppressed really, you know, in in the kind of place like the creek, um, and then, and then when you go to a place like. Uh, Mount Crawford, where the beginning of the movie takes place, um, I was just a, I was just a, you know, a nosy Parker basically uh, because it wasn't my, it wasn't my scene. But I, you know, I went up to Mount Crawford as well to to just check it out. But you know, it's so idyllic and so beautiful, and the pine trees uh, that you know when you shoot the kind of violence that you shoot, you know, in in that peaceful place, it, it becomes even more jarring, right? So if you watch the first 15 minutes of the film, it, it's very jarring, you know? It starts off so beautifully, and, you know, there's something so 
uh, serene valley. And then that explosion of violence. So that really helps, you know, when you're in a place like that, you know, you're just looking at all the pine trees and it's beautiful and you're there at dawn and, and with Lee Creek, you know, it was hellish basically because, you know, I mean, it, it's, it was so hot and, it, you know, the earth is scorched and, and so it's very easy to visualize outworld. And it really, I mean, there's just not much stuff that they kind of use to augment that. I mean, when you see that, I mean, it's, you know, people will argue that, no, no, that's visual effects, but it isn't. You know, I think Jermaine McMicking was uh, very, very smart in his use of the lenses and, uh, you know, and also the, the incredible drone shots that were, that we had, you know, for the, for the, for the scene. I mean, that's all, you know, that's all very useful for an actor. Yeah. And beyond even just the locations and, and the camera work within the film, there's a real cinematic scope to a lot of the blocking within the scenes. You know, when you're marching through that desolate land and it's you and your whole team of comrades and there's a huge scope to that in the way that the camera pulls back and we see you all. And then later on when Shang Tsung's watching his team in battle essentially and every single corner of the frame has some sort of action or character detail happening in it. So when you were, when it came down to the blocking of the scenes, I wanted to ask about the way in which you were all always thinking about every single aspect of the frame and how that impacted some of your movement within scene and some of your choices that you made. Well, when you're doing something like that, obviously, I mean, there, there were many different uh, uh, versions of the uh, of how that scene was going to be storyboarded. Uh, one very thrilling version of it was a one shot, <laughs> a one shot take of the entire fight. <laughs> and that was stunning to look at. I mean, I have to say, I'm, but that was an early, you know, uh, an early storyboard, but it was like, you know, camera that was moving and swooping in and tracking and moving and pulling out and one shot, right? I mean, that that was so stunning. But obviously, I mean, by the time, the practicality of that, I mean, by the time we got to do it, um, you know, was, was, was tricky because we have so many fights going on at the same time. Now, the thing about doing something when you have so many characters fighting at the same time, but you know, there is foreground and background, foreground and background. That means you're acting all the time. You know, I mean, you know, there are times when you're in the foreground, you're doing it. If you're in the background, you're still acting, you know, and then you're in the background for, for the, uh, not, 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 to, not to give away spoilers, but you know, if, if it's Liu Kang fighting and you're in the background of that, then you have to be in the background of that. And then, you know, but then if they reverse the shot and they're covering jacks for another part of it, you know, they have to go back to the, you know, to the, the shot that they had done earlier to see if you are in camera too. And if you are, then you're, you know, you're going to be there, you know, you're going to be blocked there as well. I mean, you're going to be positioned there as well. So, it is very, uh, it is very uh, uh, tiring <laughs> because, because, you know, foreground or background, you know, you're, you're acting, you know, and so you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're doing a, a very uh, full day, you know, when, when you're shooting an action sequence that way. And in terms of one of the aspects that I imagine is exhausting as well, it's it's going back to the costume and the amount of weight and the fact that you're wearing this costume that took a whole team of people to put on because it had so many different moving parts to it. And, and I know that you had an opportunity to do some camera tests with that costume early on. So how did that impact figuring out what his movement was going to be? Because this is a character that has to command people even just with his presence and then every single movement movement has to really dictate something to the rest of them. Yeah, the, the costume itself, uh, you know, uh, a lot, you know, will, will determine how you move, right? Because of the, basically of how it is, you know, how it is articulated, you know, I mean, the joints and shoulders and elbows and even, you know, feet, uh, legs and boots and, and uh, even around the waist too. And, uh, you know, so the costume itself, I think was about 20 pounds, I would say. Uh, I, Joe, Joe was mentioning 10 kg 
So that works out to about 20 pounds. I think for, he was, his was very, very heavy as well, because as you can see, he's also armored up. And so am I. So, you know, um, I, <laughs> you know, going back to the 1995 version, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. You know, I mean, Carrie, Carrie just had to wear a leather jacket. That's wonderful. Um, <laughs> this 20 pounds of armor. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, you know, I think you kind of, it, it weighs you, you know, it weighs you down, it slows you down. You know, you kind of find your center in, in a different place. You know, I mean, I think when, when that kind of weight is on you, you kind of find your center slightly lower. And, and, and then, you know, when you move into a space, um, you know, the, the, the speed of which kind of determines the, the status of the, of the character as well, you know, yeah. I think. <laughs> so. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your overall relationship with acting because you started out working in theater and, and on screen and then you stepped back for a number of years and focused more on directing and, and producing and have talked in the past about how you didn't find at the time that acting was giving you the fulfillment that you initially had had from it and that you really wanted from it. And then you came back in and doing The Dark Knight and then that obviously led to a slew of other roles immediately following. And so I was really interested and fascinated in when you stepped back into acting after taking some time away and, and taking on these other roles, how your relationship with your work and your craft really shifted and the type of appreciation that you have for it now that maybe feels different to it did the way that it did earlier in your career. It's a, it's a different relationship, obviously. I mean, I think that when you're starting out uh, as a young person, um, it's, you know, I, I think there is a, the, the point of view is, I think it's a little more uh, contained, right? To yourself and to your career and where you want it to go. Uh, I think as you get older, you realize that every movie has its place. Every project that you do, you know, noble failures or magnificent successes has its place, you know? And in that sense, that kind of lack of preciousness about the stuff that you do frees you, you know, I mean, to, to take risks and to, to do stuff that, you know, that, that, that could be tricky, you know, especially when you're doing things like that have a, a source, you know, that have source IP that is well loved, you know, whether it is, you know, Ghost in the Shell that is a beloved anime, you know, and, and, and manga, uh, or um, Mortal Kombat, which is, you know, has a 30 year history. And you know that there are fans out there who have very, very clear ideas of what they want to see. You know, uh, in that kind of time, I, I think you're, you're freer to, you know, you feel freer to explore, I think, you know, I mean, what, what you've, feel like you want to do with the character. Uh, I think as a younger person, I think, you know, all that, all those considerations could be very overwhelming, I think. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that comes with age, I think, you know, I think you're, you're able to see your career in the context of something else. I think you're able to, to see that. On top of the fact that I think directing and producing also helped a lot, I think. Um, you know, to understand the mechanics of it and how movies are put together or a play is put together or a musical. Um, because, you know, there, there are so many moving parts in all of it. And what you want to do as a director really is to have the sum of the parts be larger, you know, I mean, that the, the whole be larger than the sum of the parts. Whereas as an actor, I mean, you just see your part in it and it, it is such a, you know, it's such a, uh, consuming endeavor that sometimes you fail to see everything around you. So, so I remember when you're younger, you know, you get so sensitive to everything, right? I mean, you, you, you go in for rehearsal or you finish a performance one evening or you don't get the applause that you get, you know, the night before or that, you know, a director doesn't respond to you, uh, you know, a particular day when he was so effusive the day before. I mean, you, you kind of, understand that he could be thinking of something completely 
different. You know, he could be thinking of, uh, yeah, permits or licenses or, you know, or, or negotiations for, you know, another actor that's coming on, on board. You know, he, he could be thinking of a million and one things that have nothing to do with you. And so once again, those are some of the things that are, you know, good to know at this point, you know, because they, they kind of ease the process uh, a bit more. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that and a very genuine congratulations on everything with Mortal Kombat. So excited for everybody to see it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark.